the problem of evil. This is a continuation of Learning Module 4 slideshow. This is the second part of two parts. Question 4. How do some philosophers resolve the problem of evil? Let's look at David Hume. In his Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion, published anonymously in 1779, after his death, David Hume presents a dialogue between three fictional philosophers. Hume did not release it in his lifetime because public skepticism about religion, God, and the authority of the Church was unpopular and often led to persecution. In the book, two religiously inclined philosophers defend religious views against the doubts and criticisms of another. There's Cleanthes. He's an advocate of religion. His belief is based on empirical evidence. For example, design in nature is evidence for God's existence. There's Demia. He is an advocate of religion also. He bases his belief on reasoning based on faith and revelation. And then there's Philo. Philo is a skeptic. That is, he's not convinced that God exists or is all good. Scholars think Philo is closest to Hume's own views about religion. Hume thought evil is real. Here's what he says. A perpetual war is kindled among all living creatures. Necessity, hunger, and want stimulate the strong and courageous. Fear, anxiety, and terror agitate the weak and infirm. The first entrance into life gives anguish to the newborn infant and to its wretched parent. Weakness, impotence, and distress attend every stage of life, and it is at last finished in agony and horror. Observe, too, the curious artifices of nature, in order to embitter the life of every living being. Consider that innumerable race of insects, which either are bred on the body of each animal or, flying about, infix their stings in him. Every animal is surrounded by enemies, which incessantly seek his misery and destruction. Man is the greatest enemy of man. Oppression, injustice, contempt, violence, sedition, war, calumny, treachery, fraud. By these they mutually torment each other. This is an excerpt from his Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion. Hume did not think all of the evil in this world is necessary. Cleanthes in his defense of God, presumes that there is more happiness than misery, more pleasure than pain in this world. Philo disagrees, since this is contrary to everyone's feelings and experience, and it's impossible to measure. Nevertheless, Philo says, I will allow that pain or misery in man is compatible with infinite power and goodness in the deity. Even in your sense of these attributes, what have you advanced by all these concessions? A mere possible compatibility is not sufficient. You must prove these pure, unmixed, that is, entirely good and uncontrollable attributes from the present mixed and confused phenomena, that is, good and evil, and from these alone. For Hume, God's infinite power and goodness are suspect. Philo continues, As God's goodness is not antecedently established, but must be inferred from the phenomena, there can be no grounds for such an inference, while there are so many ills in the universe. And while these ills might so easily have been remedied, as far as human understanding can be allowed to judge on such a subject, I am skeptic enough to allow that the bad appearances, notwithstanding all my reasonings, may be compatible with such attributes as you suppose. But surely they can never prove these attributes. So here's his first point. Even if the reality of evil is consistent with the existence of God, this leaves theism with a big problem. The enormous degree of evil in this world and the vast range of forms that it takes are impossible to explain or justify without getting mysterious or pleading ignorance to the wise ways of gods. Point two. Thus, there is no basis for inferring the existence of an infinitely power and good God in the face of contrary evidence, for such evidence provides people with reasonable grounds for doubting this hypothesis. There are so many ills in this universe, and these ills might so easily have been remedied or lessened. Leibniz thought that the reason for this world is that it is the best. 
Now, as there is an infinity of possible universes in the ideas of God, and as only one of them can exist, there must be a sufficient reason for God's choice, which determines him toward one rather than the other. And this reason can be found only in the fitness or the degrees of perfection that these worlds contain, since each possible thing has the right to claim existence in proportion to the perfection it involves. This is the cause for the existence of the greatest good, namely, that the wisdom of God permits him to know it, his goodness causes him to choose it, and his power enables him to produce it. This is from Leibniz Monadology, published in 1714. Leibniz thought that a world with evil might be better than a world without evil. Leibniz grants that there is evil in this world which God has made, and that it was possible to make a world without evil, or with less evil. He denies that whoever makes things in which there is evil does not choose the best, because the best plan is not always that which seeks to avoid evil, since it may happen that the evil be accompanied by a greater good. For example, a general of the army will prefer a great victory, with a slight wound, to a condition without wound and without victory. Leibniz agrees with St. Augustine. God permitted evil in order to bring about good, that is, a greater good. Leibniz echoes Thomas Aquinas, who has said that the permitting of evil tends to the good of the universe. So Leibniz thought that evil exists for the sake of the good. Here's what he says in his Theodicy from 1710. I have shown that the ancients called Adam's fall, when Adam and Eve were cast out of the Garden of Eden for disobedience, Felix culpa, a happy sin, because it had been retrieved with immense advantage by the incarnation of the Son of God, who has given to the universe something nobler than anything that ever would have been among creatures except for this. I have added, following many good authors, that it was in accordance with order and the general good that God gave to certain creatures the opportunity of exercising their liberty, even when he foresaw that they would turn to evil, but which he could so well rectify, because it was not right that, in order to hinder sin, God should always act in an extraordinary manner. Leibniz presents classical theodicies, that is, defenses of God and God's divine attributes, being all-knowing, all-powerful, all-good, in light of all of the actual evil in the world. Leibniz argues that it is narrow-minded and short-sighted to think that human happiness is the best standard to judge the goodness of the world. The happiness, the happiness of people or rational creatures need not be the primary goal of God and God's creation. Okay, two problems make God appear to be less than what theists, such as Leibniz, suppose him to be. How is it that a being that is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-good can allow so much evil to exist? So the first problem we call the underachiever problem. That is, the evil in our world seems to show that God cannot be as knowledgeable, powerful, or good as traditional monotheists have claimed. If this world, with all of its flaws, is the best God could do, then it is really one big underachievement. The second problem is called the holiness problem. That is, God, the author of nature, is implicated in the evil which comprises his goodness. God's ultimate and intimate causal entanglements with the world make God the cause of evil, or the enabler of evil. With great power comes great responsibility. Leibniz has an answer. This world is really the best of all possible worlds. God could not have done a better job overall. This is a version of the God permits evil so as to bring about a greater good defense, or theodicy, which is an attempt to show that evil does not conflict with the goodness and greatness of God. Leibniz presumes or implies that we are ignorant or cannot conceive of God's overall plan. Leibniz raises an objection which he rejects. If there is more evil than good in intelligent creatures, then there is more evil than good in the whole work of God. Now, there is more evil than good in intelligent creatures. Therefore, there is more evil than good in the whole work of God. That's his objection. He rejects this. Leibniz rejects the assumptions because... It is possible, and in fact very probable, that the glory and the perfection of the blessed are incomparably greater than the misery and the imperfection of the damned, and that here the excellence of the total good in the smaller number exceeds the total evil in the great number. This is from his Theodicy, published in 1710. But Leibniz just asserts this explanation without proof. One wonders what, if anything, might show that evil is, in fact, 
necessary for the greater total good of the world. He just assumes that any evil has got to be necessary. But why this is so remains mysterious. The moral evil humans do somehow must be a necessary part of the greater good, which only God knows. In short, we do not understand the nature of God and the functional value of evil. This is Bertrand Russell's response to that. It is also possible that the Creator is not good. Leibniz's solution of the problem of evil is logically possible, but not very convincing. One might respond that this is the worst of all possible worlds in which the good things that exist serve only to heighten the evils. The world, one might say, was created by a wicked Creator designer who allowed free will, which is good, in order to make sure of sin, which is bad and of which the evil outweighs the good of free will. This being created some virtuous men in order that they might be punished by the wicked, for the punishment of the virtuous is so great an evil that it makes the world worse than if no good men existed. I am not advocating this opinion, which I consider fantastic. I am only saying that it is no more fantastic than Leibniz's theory. People wish to think the universe good and will be lenient to bad arguments proving that it is so while bad arguments proving that it is bad are closely scanned. In fact, of course, the world is partly good and partly bad, and no problem of evil arises unless this obvious fact is denied. This is Bertrand Russell in his History of Western Philosophy, published in 1945. Now let's consider the view of contemporary philosopher John Hick, specifically his view on evil and soul-making. Here's what he said in 1966 in Evil and the God of Love. If, then, God's aim in making the world is the bringing of many sons to glory, that aim will naturally determine the kind of world that he has created. Anti-theistic writers almost invariably assume a conception of the divine purpose which is contrary to the Christian conception. They assume that the purpose of a loving God must be to create a hedonistic paradise, and therefore, to the extent that the world is other than this, it proves to them that God is either not loving enough or not powerful enough to create such a world. They think of God's relation to the earth on the model of a human being building a cage for a pet animal to dwell in. If he is humane, he will naturally make his pet's quarters as pleasant and healthful as he can. Any respect in which the cage falls short of the veterinarian's ideal and contains possibilities of accident or disease is evidence of either limited benevolence or limited means, or both. Those who use the problem of evil as an argument against belief in God almost invariably think of the world in this kind of way. So Hick thought, human freedom requires evil in the world in order to shape character. In fact, he believed soul-making is a great good. People need adversity and the chance to make mistakes and fail and experience suffering in order to succeed and learn compassion and also appreciate what they have. God is, or is like, a loving parent who does desire pleasure for his children, but not at the expense of developing moral integrity, unselfishness, compassion, courage, humor, reverence for the truth, and a capacity for love. The God that outshines all ill is not a paradise long since lost, but a kingdom which is yet to come in its full glory and permanence. All right, Edward Madden and Peter Hare have a critique of Hick, Hick's argument, his argument that evil is soul-making. Three dubious assumptions of the evil is necessary theodicies, such as Hick's. Number one, without evil, free will and greater good are not possible. This seems to be the assumption of evil is necessary explanations. However, it's possible that there be less and still freedom and good are possible. It isn't an all-or-nothing choice. God could accomplish this. The second dubious assumption presumed by the evil is necessary explanation. Things could be worse. But pointing out that some good comes from some evil fails to explain why there is so much. Things could have been better, too. If God eliminated some of the evil, then God could not stop until the world was perfect and we would be mindless machines. But this dubious assumption also has a problem. God could stop short of annihilating all evil, 
God could give people better inclinations or make it so that children are not raped, say. But is all of this immense and profound suffering necessary to produce human souls of good character? Hick needs to show us that every evil produces something that cannot be achieved any other way, even by an omnipotent God. He doesn't do this with his evil is soul-making argument. It's unfair to say that opponents of his theodicy see humans as pets or as deserving happiness or a mostly happy life. We accept that adversity builds character, whether we experience it directly or by witnessing the suffering of others. Hick must show that epidemics must be as devastating as they are, not that epidemics teach us to appreciate life. The main objection to Hick's defense is that we fail to see how the terrible suffering of so many, much of it out of the sight of others, is required so that we are free or moral or compassionate. Can't one become compassionate with less suffering? Surely God could arrange less and still allow suffering so we can learn valuable life and death lessons. When you experience the suffering of a loved one, their suffering is the issue here, not your own ability to be free or your learning to be compassionate from their personal horrors. Consider the ways so many people suffer. Why cholera? Three to five million cases with over 100,000 deaths occur each year around the world. Here's Stephen Shapin on cholera. The onset of the disease is typically quick and spectacular. You can be healthy one moment and dead within hours. The disease, left untreated, has a fatality rate that can reach 50%. The first sign that you have it is a sudden and explosive watery diarrhea classically described as rice water stool, resembling the water in which rice has been rinsed and sometimes having a fishy smell. White specks floating in the stool are bits of lining from the small intestine. As a result of water loss, vomiting often accompanies diarrhea and as much as a liter of water may be lost per hour. Your eyes become sunken. Your body is racked with agonizing cramps. The skin becomes leathery. Lips and face turn blue. Blood pressure drops. Heartbeat becomes irregular. The amount of oxygen reaching your cells diminishes. Once you enter hypervolemic shock, death can follow within minutes. A mid-19th century English newspaper report described cholera victims who were one minute warm, palpitating human organisms, the next a sort of galvanized corpse with icy breath, stopped pulse, and blood congealed, blue, shriveled up, convulsed. Through it all and until the very last stages is the added horror of full consciousness. You are aware of what's happening. The mind within remains untouched and clear, shining strangely through the glazed eyes, a spirit looking out in terror from a corpse. So let's get more specific. Let's say a little bit more about these responses to the evil is necessary explanation. Look again at these unproved presumptions. Number one, without evil, free will and greater good are not possible. Response, but why not fewer starving children and the same amount of free will for people? God could do this. Why so much spectacular suffering? Assumption two, things could be worse. Response, we do not expect perfection or no suffering. We are not whining about all suffering. But couldn't God have made things a little less worse? Say, fewer people dying or dying less painfully as so many people do in earthquakes or plagues, things could have been better. Why not? Assumption three. If God eliminated some of the evil, then God could not stop until the world was perfect and we would be mindless machines. Response. God need not eliminate all evil. Sure, some might be necessary. But God could give some people better inclinations. Why not just make parents and priests so that they never find children sexually appealing? Is this necessary? Question 5. What viable options are there for people who wonder whether evil and God are compatible? Option 1. Be a friendly atheist. Here's William Rowe. Friendly atheism is reasonable. Probably there are pointless evils. For example, the horribly burned baby animal in a forest fire who dies after five anguishing days. Now, if God exists, then there are no pointless evils. So probably God does not exist. Roe does not disprove God's existence. 
He aims to show that some people have good reason to think it is unlikely that God exists, given evil. On the traditional view of God, number two, if God exists, then there are no pointless evils, is true. Many, such as Leibniz and Hick, for instance, say evil is really for the best or an essential part of God's plan. But most theists will reject assumption one, the idea that there are any pointless evils. They'll reject this, say, if God intends some greater good, which we cannot imagine. Rowe is charitable towards theists who have strong reasons to believe that God exists, say, they have compelling religious experiences. He advocates for non-believers that they be friendly atheists, one who accepts that some theists are justified in believing in God, even if it's the case that God doesn't exist. An unfriendly atheist is someone who thinks no one is justified in believing in God. Here's William Rowe's argument, The Inductive Problem of Evil. It's called inductive because the conclusion is not necessarily true, but it's probably true given the evidence Rowe presents. Claim 1. There exist instances of intense suffering which an omnipotent, omniscient being could have prevented without thereby losing some greater good or permitting some evil equally bad or worse. Number 2. An omniscient, holy good being would prevent the occurrence of any intense suffering it could, unless it could not do so, without thereby losing some greater good or permitting some evil equally bad or worse. Number three, and this is the conclusion, therefore, probably, there does not exist an omnipotent, omniscient, holy good being. Notice that Rowe generates a serious challenge. The theodicist, apologist, now must show that there are no instances of pain and suffering anywhere in the world and at any point in the history of all sentient creatures. Apologists must show that claim one is false. But are there really no instances of pointless suffering? The apologist thinks so. We want them to prove it. The case of the fawns suffering due to the forest fire does not establish the truth of claim one. Since that case might serve some greater good, Rowe's point is that some such case is enough to show there is some excessive, pointless, unnecessary suffering. It's the pointless suffering which is the problem. Let's take a closer look at Rowe's second assumption, the idea that an omniscient, wholly good being would prevent the occurrence of any intense suffering it could, unless it could not do so without losing some greater good. If the theist cannot justify each case of apparently pointless suffering, then disbelieving that there exists an omnigod and evil is reasonable. It's not obvious that there just has to be a good reason. One response to Roe is to deny that there are any pointless evils. But this is an evasion or a denial of the problem which just presumes what needs proving. That is, why should we just accept that no evil is pointless when we can imagine any intense human or animal suffering and then imagine a bit less of it? Why shall we presume that God cannot accomplish what he wills without every bit of suffering there is? We do not need to justify evil by denying that it exists. To say that there is no pointless suffering that God could reduce or eliminate amounts to saying that all suffering is necessary. This implies there is no evil just suffering, and all suffering has a purpose. Here's option two. Let it go. God might not be all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good. There are two varieties of this, two options, given that evil and God might coexist. Number one, we could accept the hypothesis that an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good God exists, and then explain the presence of excessive pain and suffering. This is theodicy, an effort to reconcile the existence of some evil with the existence of any god. Theistic thinkers who do this are called apologists. They are legion. Some are friendly towards atheists and some are not. Again, the second option. Don't accept the hypothesis that God exists, so there is no need to explain why so much pain and suffering exists. Why? Why would anybody take this position? Why would they give up the hypothesis that God exists and 
say we don't need to explain why there's so much pain and suffering. One reason might be for lack of evidence. Another reason might be there's negative evidence. Some atheists and skeptics or agnostics base their non-belief on 2A. That is, they don't accept the hypothesis that God exists because they don't have enough evidence. The God hypothesis is not necessary, as logic demonstrates, nor required, science shows, in order for us to understand and explain reality. They don't claim to know that God exists, these atheists. They just don't believe it. Hardcore atheists base their disbelief in God on both of these, the lack of evidence and the presence of negative evidence, where the negative evidence is the excessive evil, the pointless suffering. Some hardcore theists, sorry, some hardcore atheists are friendly and some are not. There are other similar solutions to the problem of evil worth considering here. For instance, let OG be the Omni-God. Again, the Omni-God is the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good God of Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Assume that if any pointless suffering exists, then there is no Omni-God. Or assume either there is no pointless suffering or there is no Omni-God. Now stop and look at this. Think about it for a second. There are these choices. Number one, if there is an Omni-God, then there's no pointless suffering. This is the position most theists and apologists take. There's no pointless suffering. The second assumption, there is an omni-god. Theists believe this. Three, conclusion, therefore, there is no pointless suffering. Call this the evil is illusory solution. Okay, here's a rival argument. Number one, if there is an omni-god, then there is no pointless suffering. Notice that Theists and atheists accept some version of this. If there is an omni-god, then there is no pointless suffering. However, atheists, agnostics, skeptics find there is pointless suffering. Conclusion, therefore, there is no God. There probably is no God. This is the God is not real or a great solution. Thus, it's reasonable not to believe in the omni-god since some reasonable arguments introduce serious doubt. There is another option. You could adopt uh, an ancient religion, a kind of religion called deism. It's the idea that God made the world but chooses not to interfere in its affairs. So, premise five in the argument about, I'm about to show you is false and the argument itself fails. Number one, accept that there exist states of affairs in which animals die agonizing deaths in forest fires or where children undergo lingering suffering and eventual death due to cancer and that A, these are intrinsically bad or undesirable, and B, these states are such that any omnipotent being has the power to prevent them, without thereby either allowing an equal or greater evil or preventing an equal or greater good. Number two, for any state of affairs that is actual, the existence of that state of affairs is not prevented by anyone. Number three, for any state of affairs in any being, if the state of affairs is intrinsically bad, and the omnipotent being has the power to prevent that state of affairs without thereby either allowing an equal or greater evil, or preventing an equal or greater good, but does not do so, then that being is not both omniscient and omnibenevolent. Number four, therefore, from these assumptions, one, two, and three, there is no omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent being. Number five, if God exists, then God is an omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent being. Again, this is false if deism is true. Number six, therefore God does not exist. Option three, one could evade, deny, or shift the blame for evil. You have to watch out for what's called by philosophers the no true Scotsman fallacy. So let's take a moment and consider what this mistaken pattern of reasoning is. Sometimes in a discussion, a person makes a general assertion that others reject. 
because they are able to describe examples that contradict it or show it is false. At this point, either the person who makes the general assertion agrees that the claim is a mistake or they just reassert it and use the example to support their general assertion all over again. People often do this when a favorite opinion is threatened by a fact or contrary evidence. It looks like a kind of question begging, but its pattern is somewhat different. Here's an example. Can you see the problem? This is from Anthony Flew uh, in his 1975 Thinking About Thinking, where he's describing this bad pattern of reasoning. Imagine Hamish MacDonald, a Scotsman, sitting down with his Glasgow Morning Herald and seeing an article about how the Brighton sex maniac strikes again. Hamish is shocked and declares that no Scotsman would do such a thing. The next day, he sits down to read his Glasgow Morning Herald again, and, it, and this time he finds an article about an Aberdeen man whose brutal actions make the Brighton sex maniac seem almost gentlemanly. Now, Aberdeen is in Scotland. This fact shows that Hamish was wrong in his opinion, but is he going to admit this? Not likely. This time he says, well, no true Scotsman would do such a thing. He's not a real Scotsman if he does sort, that sort of thing. So here are examples of the no true Scotsman fallacy being used with respect to God and whether God exists and the problem of evil. Suppose a theist says, all evil has a purpose. None of it is pointless. Evil serves some greater good. God has a plan, even if people can't understand it. Sounds plausible. The atheist responds, but there is the heartbreaking suffering of innocent children in war zones, which God could mitigate. Moral evil. And there is the agonizing suffering of animals in floods and forest fires, natural evil. Even if you don't acknowledge natural evil, we are all aware of some pointless suffering. Here's how the theist responds. Well, all of that suffering, including the starving children and animals, is not really pointless. It's actually a part of God's plan, too. It must serve some greater good overall. Here's another example. A preacher says, all religion is harmless. It's bad people who use it wrongly that do harm. The skeptic says, but religious doctrine X inspires or rewards harms. For example, xenophobia, animal sacrifice, subordination of women, persecution, genocide, terrorism. The preacher says, no, no true religion inspires or rewards harm. Only bad people do this. Do you see the person is just sort of reasserting what they believe to begin with without ever having provided proof for it? Watch out for the apologist's trump card. People say, God has reasons for allowing pointless, undeserved suffering which our self-centered, weak minds cannot know or understand. In short, there really is no pointless suffering. All suffering is for some greater good and part of God's plan. Imagine how one could also use this line of reasoning for a bad parent or evil dictator. Just substitute their name in for God here. This response to evil amounts to saying that for any, in every case of seemingly excessive, gratuitous, pointless, undeserved suffering we experience, witness or even imagine, it is really for the best. It is all good. It really isn't bad from God's perspective. Really? This solution to the problem of evil is only apparent. It assumes what is not proved and amounts to a denial and evasion of the problem. It presumes illicitly that God exists that evil is not real or only apparent, and that all of the evil is a necessary means to achieving a great good that only God could produce in this world in this way. It presumes that the only way to fulfill God's plan is for humans and all other sentient creatures to suffer as they do. So, animal sacrifice, poaching, hunting, it's all good. Can we really convince ourselves that the September 11th World Trade Center attacks were not evil, or that such evil was somehow not pointless, even necessary? It's all good, I guess. This is the famous Ground Zero Cross found in 2001 in the debris of the World Trade Center collapse. What is this? Is this a miracle or evidence of God's plan? Look up Ground Zero Cross in Wikipedia on this. Here is William Lane Craig. His idea, his view, is that we are just not in a good position to judge whether the evil we observe in the world is truly pointless. 
Craig produces a nice example of the evil is somehow necessary, or evil is really good solution. Maybe only in a world containing pointless suffering could the maximum number of people freely come to know God and find eternal life. Maybe. Maybe not. Craig quotes William Alston, It is impossible in principle for us to be justified in supposing that God does not have sufficient reasons for permitting evil. Is it, is it really impossible for us to be justified in supposing this? In short, this is the idea that pointless suffering really isn't pointless. But you have to ask, is such suffering really the only way God could accomplish His plan? William Lane Craig thinks, in fact, that the actual existence of evil proves the existence of God. So it's worth taking a moment to look at this. Although the suffering in the world may constitute a significant emotional obstacle to belief in God, at the end of the day, I do not think it constitutes a significant intellectual objection against God's existence. Here's Craig's argument. Number one, if God does not exist, then objective moral values do not exist. Evil exists. Therefore, objective moral values exist. That is to say, some things are really evil. Therefore, God exists. But premise one presumes too much. We can imagine a world where no gods exist and objective moral values exist. Otherwise, it would not be possible for people to be good without God. Morals evolve spontaneously in groups of animals where cooperation and not acting purely selfishly all of the time actually benefits the cohesion and survival of social groups. Good behavior could have emerged among proto-humans who realized that sometimes promoting the interests of the group was better objectively than competing with each other all the time. Lots more is possible than Craig imagines. Not murdering and not stealing were good ideas before gods or religions commanded that it was so. Also, blaming people evades the issue, but it works. Some people say that the only evil is the evil that men do. But this does not relieve the omni-god of all responsibility, as he could have made humans a little less sadistic, bloodthirsty, cruel, and self-absorbed. Well, people say the world is just like that. There is suffering, some of it caused by people, some of it caused by nature or accident. Yes. But, can one really say that God has nothing to do with it? After all, God made the world. Sure, people need to eat and thrive, but is all of the non-human animal suffering necessary? It's all good. Theist's best answer is this, that all of the evil is either bad people exercising their free will poorly, or all of the evil is required for God's plan, leaving us to imagine that God must have good reasons for letting the world carry on as it does. Either way, where is the divine love? Last point. Suppose that the moral evil is all that is really evil, that is the evil that people do, and the blame rests with people, because God lets people exercise their will freely, and lots of us make bad choices. So, the next time you see a child molested by a trusted elder or slaughtered in a missile attack, tell yourself, it is for the best, or this needs to happen so that other people can be free. Here is Elie Wiesel from his book of 1960, Night. Never shall I forget that night, the first night in camp, which has turned my life into one long night seven times cursed and seven times sealed. Never shall I forget that smoke. Never shall I forget the little faces of the children whose bodies I saw turned into wreaths of smoke beneath a silent blue sky. Never shall I forget those flames which consume my faith forever. Never shall I forget that nocturnal silence which deprived me for all eternity of the desire to live. Never shall I forget those moments which murdered my God and my soul and turned my dreams to dust. Never shall I forget these things, even if I am condemned to live as long as God himself. Never. This is an image from Buchenwald concentration camp under Nazi Germany in April 1945. 
it comes down to this. It's possible that evil exists and that God exists and that God does not prevent evil because God has a good ultimate reason for allowing evil. It is also possible that evil exists and that no God exists and that there is no good ultimate reason for evil. Now, these are not the only positions on the possibility of God and evil, but they are reasonable positions. One explains away evil by making the justification for evil a mystery and just saying to oneself, it's all good. The other says evil needs no ultimate justification or explanation. Evil is bad and pointless. Both positions are possibly true because each is only about what is possible, but you have to decide which of these is actually true. So you have to accept a divine mystery or a brutal fact. Either way, evil is a problem we can't just think away. This is the end of Learning Module 4, Slideshow, Part 2 of Two Parts.